know. Come on, give God glory. Come on, if you want to be closer to him. Come on, if that's your heartfelt desire. If you want to be close to him. Make it your prayer. Draw me nearer. I want to be closer. I may be close now, but I want to be closer than I am. And tomorrow I want to be closer than I am today. Is there anybody who wants to be closer? Is there anyone who wants to be closer? Is there anybody who wants to be closer? Just lift your hand and worship him for a minute. Come on, tell him what he wants to hear. Tell him how close you want to be to him. Tell him how much you need him, how much you lean on him, how much you depend on him. Oh, we want to be closer. 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 Draw us, draw us. Hallelujah. God, you said if we draw near to you, you'll draw nigh unto us. Meet us halfway. Ha hallelujah. Meet us halfway, God. In earnest and in sincerity. We come to you. <laughs> yes, we do. Meet us halfway. Draw us. Draw us. <laughs> Draw us. Draw us. Draw us. To your precious bleeding side. Well, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. We do honor and reverence the spirit of our Christ and greet each and every one in the name that matters most. And that is the matchless and majestic name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. The word of God is right when it declares there's no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. And so we're thankful to be the recipients and beneficiaries of everything that comes in and with the name of Jesus. There's still salvation in that name. There's still healing in that name and deliverance and restoration, elevation and anointing. It's all in the name of Jesus. Somebody ought to just shout that name one time. Hallelujah. Still the sweetest name I know. Welcome to those of you who are watching today there in cyberspace from uh, around this uh, world and uh, across this country. We thank you for joining us into the best church anywhere. This side of heaven, Temple Church International. Good morning to you. We love you again. There's just a handful of us in here today, uh, but we're just making the rock teal in the ground, making it ready for the time that the people of God are able to uh, to congregate and join together safely again, that we might worship Him and the beauty of His holiness and worship Him in spirit and truth. I want to thank God for all uh, who share on this place today. I'm always uh, mindful of the fact that. Uh, uh, you are only as good as the people that you surround yourself with. And so I want to thank God for the ministerial staff of Temple Church International and the leaders of Temple Church International who in this season of transition and pandemic uh, have been faithful to serve uh, in every way and any way that they've been asked to do so. And so we thank God for all of our ministers and all of our leaders. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise. Even in here, celebrate yourselves, leader. We thank God for you. And uh, most certainly, we thank God for uh, the music ministry of Temple Church International. These, this band is unreal. And thank God for the singers as well. My baby sister, Tony, Tony I'm telling you now, uh, dad and mom and I have never fallen out about anything. But, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you keep on now. It's gonna be you and St. Quay going to be. Hallelujah. We thank God. John chapter number four. John chapter number four. I'm continuing um, a series of, uh, of messages on the vision of Temple Church International, and I pray uh, that uh, I've been as clear as possible that you would understand uh, what it is that drives us, what it is that moves us by way of vision. And we don't talk a lot about buildings or, or the acquisition of things, uh, but we, the vision of Temple Church International uh, is simply God work and uh, that it, uh, and that we seek to get to know him better through worship, personal and uh, corporate uh, devotion. We seek to get to know one another better, um, koinonia, fellowshipping within the community of believers. And we uh, seek to help 
the world, those who are outside who don't know uh, Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, don't know God as their Father, uh, we seek uh, to help them to get to know God better through us. So we're dealing now with that second tenet, this tenet on koinonia or spiritual community. Um, um, I didn't intend, Elder Colbert, to, to, to go down this, uh, down this uh, uh, rabbit trail of, of fear, but one of the things I'm understanding is that fear keeps us from being uh, a spiritual community. It keeps us from getting to know one another better. Um, there, there, there's something about life uh, and having dealt with life for a certain amount of time that literally causes you to be leery and reluctant to be in relationship with people. <laughs> there's some life's experiences that are so impactful that will cause you to be leery of relationship. Even in church, we call it church hurt, right? <laughs> and so that experience will cause us uh, to be uh, not only leery, but weary as it relates to functioning within the context of, of the church. So what happens is, for many of us, uh, we'll show up for worship but we won't join in or give our gifts, our talents, our abilities uh, to the community for service. <laughs> so, uh, the, 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 so, so I'm, I'm kind of dealing with that now, and I hope y'all are following that. Um, I just got to tell it like the Lord give it to me. So y'all pray for me. I don't halfway know what I'm doing myself. I want to look at John chapter number four. John chapter number four. I want to begin reading at verse number one. I'm going to read a lot. You know the story, but I just want to just kind of just kind of pick at this text a little bit and just kind of raise some uh, some, some thoughts for your consideration as uh, we we talk about this whole idea of community, uh, being a part of a spiritual community, and overcoming as we talked last week, overcoming fear. John chapter 4, verse number 1. I'm reading from the NIV. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I gave them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you said you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man that you have now is not your husband. What would you what you have said is quite true, sir. Uh, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is of the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and now has come. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they, 
uh, are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. I read all that to get here. Just then, the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water pot. The woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. That was a lot. 30 verses. The message is going to be shorter than a reading of the scriptures. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word from which... We have to share, and I thank you for your precious people with whom you've entrusted me with the responsibility and the privilege and the honor of sharing from your word with. This is a delicate moment. This is delicate material, so Father, I need you to anoint me to share the information in the way that you shared it with me. Think through my mind, speak through my mouth, move through my body, that you might be glorified, that the enemy might be horrified and that your people might be edified let a corporate anointing fall anoint me to teach and your people to learn anoint me to preach and your people to hear and anoint us all that we might hear receive and understand and apply what your word instructs it's in the name of jesus we pray and we boldly declare the devil is defeated god you are exalted and jesus you are lord and all who agree with the prayer of the man of god shout it hallelujah Amen, and thank you, Jesus. Uh, I, I want you to look with me again at that last verse that I read. Just then, verse 27 says, just then, uh, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman, but no one asks, what do you want or why you're talking with her? Verse 28, then leaving her water pot or her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. I want to talk to you from the thought overcoming avoidance and anxiety. Overcoming avoidance and anxiety. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Overcoming avoidance and anxiety. Good morning, family. My brothers and my sisters, our, tech, our scripture lesson for today is one of the most familiar in all of the Bible. It is the account of the meeting between Jesus and a woman that takes place at a well. As you well know, this seemingly random noonday encounter with Jesus radically changes this woman's life. So much so that the end result is threefold. For the Cynthia Glenn, number one, this random meeting with Jesus at the well uh, causes an exposure of misconceptions, racial biases, and denominational divisions in the name of God as social constructs that shaped this woman's theology. So that when she met Jesus and had the conversation with Jesus, what we found out was what that she had heard about God based upon certain theological perspectives was not true and understood that there, this thing called denominationalism or things trying to get God to represent certain viewpoints was nothing more than a social construct that was created by man. The second thing that happens in this chance meeting with Jesus is that this woman gets a revelation of the true of the nature of true worship. And what she found out was that true worship is about the purity and sincerity of heart in seeking God versus perfecting rigid religious protocols at designated times in designated places. Hear me again. After she had this talk with God, after she had this talk with Jesus, not only did she learn uh, that Jesus or God himself does not really have the social biases of the church. But she also found out that 
the true nature of worship is about the condition and the sincerity of your heart. And it is not about where you worship him, when you worship him, or how you move in worship. But number three, this woman found out through her conversation with Jesus, she found out that a, a sincere and passionate desire for intimacy with the creator ultimately brings you face to face with God's manifest presence. And it brings you face to face with the fact that God accepts you just the way you are. That's what she found out. She had this conversation with Jesus about race and about religion and about worship. She found out, watch this, that when you sincerely desire God, when you sincerely desire, Tony, to get close to him, when you sincerely desire to get to know him, you are rewarded, watch this, with God's manifested presence. And you will find out that all of the things that you thought that disqualified you or that you were taught that disqualified you from being in relationship with God don't have the power to make God refuse you. No, let me fix this for a minute. Remember what happens in the text. Jesus says to her, he says to her, listen, uh, please understand, it ain't about Jews or Samaritans. It ain't about where or how we worship. As long as our heart is right, as long as we sincerely, uh, sincerely pursue and desire him, he will give us what we want. But watch this. The woman says, we know that when Messiah comes, we shall see him or we shall know him. And he says, what you're looking for, you're looking at. You are already encountering God face to face. Uh, I'm preaching. Just as you are. <laughs> with all of your idiosyncrasies. Just as you are. With all of your flaws and your failures and the like. Just as you are. You are standing face to face. Eye to eye with the God of all creation. Uh, so impactful was this woman's experience with Jesus that she returns to the village in which she lived, shared the good news of her personal experience with him, and convinced the people in her community to come see a man that brought her face to face with the realities of her life and thusly freed her from her painful past and freed her to live in the present hopeful reality of a promised future. I would like to suggest to us this morning that what makes this story even more impactful, what makes it even more integral, what makes it even more relative to our spiritual growth is that it all began in a narrative of avoidance due to fear. Y'all, please follow me. One of the most common experiences in life is feeling uneasy about a situation. And the most common reaction to anxiety is to avoid the situation. But Minister Diane Barnes, I came to suggest to us today that this kind of avoidance is self-sabotage. In 1993, a group of psychologists decided that they would conduct a study on CLBP, that is chronic lower back pain. And they conducted the study, watch this, to try to figure out why so many people who had lower back injuries made, uh, made a full or reasonable recoveries. They wanted to figure out why people who had injured their lower backs, uh, few and far between, uh, recovered. How so many people, when they had lower back injuries, never returned back to their old form. And what they found out was that the pain of the injury was so impactful in their mind uh, that they observed, watch this, that the people that they studied consciously avoided the pain of rehabilitation. Yeah, 
I got to catch this again. What they observed, what they learned, what they found out was that people with chronic lower back pain uh, rarely go back to their old form, rarely come back to their own selves because the pain associated with the injury causes them to avoid the pain of getting better. Uh, thusly, they would avoid the pain of physical therapy and it actually made the injury worse and it resulted in the loss of employment, it negatively affected their relationships and it ultimately threw them into a state of personal depression. 40 million adults uh, 18 and over in America alone have been diagnosed with anxiety disorders that when unchecked prevent them from leading and living productive lives. And as quiet as is kept, many of the 40 million Americans are blood brought, spirit filled, Bible reading believers in Jesus Christ. Anxiety then is a problem even in the body of Christ. Anxiety and fear that will cause you to avoid the very thing that God has assigned you to do. Let, let's look at the text then. I'm not going to preach real long. I still ain't got all my strength back. I still ain't got all my voice. I need y'all to pray for me so I can make it through this. But in our text, as the word declares, Jesus is headed back. To Galilee and the text said he had to go through Samaria and the Bible says when he came uh, to Samaria he came to a town called Sychar and there at Sychar he stopped at a well because he was thirsty perhaps approaching dehydration I would have you to know further that in ancient culture wells symbolize life as uh, as it stands, my brothers and my sisters, wells were water sources. And so it can be deducted that whenever we see a well in the Bible, we are looking at that which represents a source of life. And it should be because wells are where water is stored. And up to 60% of the human body is water. The brain and the heart are composed of 73% water. The lungs are about 83% water. And so wherever you see a well, you see a source of human life. But then secondly, Elder Barnes, I would help us to understand that in antiquity or in the Old Testament or in ancient days, wells symbolize healthy community. So it is, my brothers and my sisters, Jesus is at a well, watch this, that is a source of that which it takes to live a human or live a, uh, a healthy life. But he is also at a place where the entire community would come that they might draw water so that they can take the water back to their families and their families can live healthy lives as well. I had to bring all that up, my brothers and my sisters, because I want you to see something. To this same well comes a woman at noonday to draw water. What's interesting is that in that day, women would travel early in the morning or late in the afternoon to draw water for their families. This woman not only comes alone, but she comes at an unconventional time. She does not travel with the women from her village in the morning. Neither does she come with them at night. She comes in the hot noonday sun. The commonly accepted explanation for this woman traveling alone at an unconventional time was that she was trying to avoid the other women of the community who were gossiping about her. She was fearful and therefore she avoided interaction and contact with them because of the opinions that they may have had 
for her. But little did this woman know, and we know it because we've read the scripture. Little did she know and little did they know that the assignment on this woman's life was to transform an entire village for the glory of God through introducing them to the one who could change everything about their lives. She had no idea that the purpose of God for her life was to make such an impact on the place in which she was reared, the place in which she lived, that everything about that place would change. I'm going to preach whether y'all want me to or not. My brothers and my sisters, as it relates to spiritual community, as it relates to us being followers of Christ, as it relates to us being believers uh, in him, one of the things I found is that we try to avoid the situations and the people and even the thoughts that are likely to distress us. This avoidance prevents us from becoming distressed in the short term, but it is one of the main factors that keeps the problem going over a long time. In other words, my brothers and my sisters, we oftentimes try to avoid stuff and people who make us eat uneasy. But the truth of the matter is the anointing and the calling that's up on your life will not allow you to live your life in a vacuum. You are not just assigned to you. You are assigned to a specific group. You are assigned to a specific place. You are sp assigned to a specific people. And God says the oil that is on your life is an oil that if you will just learn how to get over your fears and your anxieties will transform everywhere that you go. Somebody ought to shout yes Lord. This woman comes to a well. Watch this. To seek water. Watch this. Or to get the source of life but she wants to get it apart from community you miss what I said she wants to get water she wants to get the source of life uh, but she wants to get it apart from community you remember what she says to Jesus Jesus says woman give me something to drink and she he says she said you have nothing to draw with how is it that you who are a Jew ask me me a Samaritan for what we don't even deal with each other. Jesus says if you knew who it was that asked you for a drink of water you would have asked me for I have a gift for you that if you ever receive this it will spring up into you a well of water that eternally flows. The woman said give me this water, watch this, that I may never come here again, that I may never be thirsty and compelled to come to this place where they come to. He said to her, woman, you don't even understand what's, what's happening because what you want is you want to live life in a vacuum, but I want you to live your life so boldly and live your life so loudly that even the people who had written you off and counted you out can't help but see that my hand is upon your life and I'm moving you to new heights and new depths. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but the Lord sent me by to talk to a few people who have this anxiety. People who, who have this whole issue where you're trying to avoid people because of your self-awareness. God told me to tell you in this season and even on this day that you're getting ready to overcome avoidance and anxiety. You're getting ready to get free from the fear of what people think about you because you are convinced of how God feels about you. I don't know who I'm talking to but there are some gifted people who are watching now in this building who are getting ready to get back in the game and get back in the fight. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but there are some people under the sound of my voice who are saying that my yesterday is my yesterday. But God just showed me my tomorrow and right where I am, I'm 
making up my mind to say no to fear, to get free from anxiety, and never again will I avoid anything or anybody that does not have the power to control my life. Who am I talking to in here? Wave at me. I, who am I preaching to in here? Tell me something. Is there anybody in here who's made up in your mind that this day you're going to overcome avoidance and anxiety lift your hands open your mouth and shout yes Lord I got three simple points I'm gonna drop them and we going home number one God have mercy Kim Lee um, if we're going to overcome avoidance and anxiety. First thing the Lord told me to tell, not just Kim, but all of us, uh, face yourself. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's right here in the text. Mr. Mayor Tal, Lord told me to tell us that if you're going to overcome the anxiety and overcome the spirit of avoidance that keeps you from being all that God has called you to be. Face yourself. Mm. I ain't making it up. It's right here in the text. Text says that Jesus says to the woman, you knew who I was. You'd ask me for water. For the water that I'm asking you for is a temporary solution to an eternal problem. But the water I have to offer you <laughs> is an eternal solution to a temporary problem. <laughs> and the woman is so convinced by his presentation <laughs> that she says sir give me this water so that I may never thirst again <laughs> for if I don't get thirsty again I'll never have to come back to this well and if I never have to come back to this well I don't even have to deal with the people who are causing me to live in fear and avoidance. And Jesus says to her, if you want this water, go get your husband. <laughs> now here is what's interesting about the text. In biblical history, wells are always significant in male-female relationships. In biblical history, whenever some of the patriarchs found their wives or found wives uh, for their children, it happened at a well. Y'all ain't got to believe me. Uh, Abraham sent a servant to find a wife for his son Isaac. And when he sent him, said this is how you'll know who she is she'll be at a well watering her father's flock and will offer to give you water okay that ain't enough for y'all um uh, uh come here Jacob <laughs> Jacob went to stay with his uncle Laban and when he got there he saw a beautiful woman God have mercy watering her sheep and asked her to give him water for his sheep he met Rachel at a well so here it is in the text they're at a well and Jesus says to the woman y'all gonna catch this in a minute I don't want to get too deep says to the woman if you want the water I'm gonna give you Go bring your husband first. And the woman says, y'all got to catch this. Uh, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right. Um, 
<laughs> you had five. And the one you got now ain't yours. I'm going somewhere if y'all follow me. Jesus is not slamming the woman. But what he is doing is he's saying, if you want the kind of life that I have to give you, I need you to face your historical problem. And I need you to face the problem for yourself. Uh, Y'all miss what I said. Jesus did not say, you got one that ain't yours now, but go get him so I can straighten y'all out and talk to y'all about shacking up. Jesus says, listen, you don't have one, and the one you got now ain't the one. Y'all miss what I said. In other words, the husband or the band that holds your life together or the thing that keeps your life from getting out of control is not in interpersonal relationships. Y'all miss what I said. And here's what he says. The reason all five relationships have failed has to be in part due to you and not them. Y'all miss what I said. I'm going to preach whether y'all want me to or not. He says you got to face yourself. Because if you had five failed marriages and the one you're in now ain't right. We must deal with the issues that are in your life that are making you spiral out of control. And if ever you're going to get over, whatever your fears and anxieties are, at some point you got to face yourself. You got to face the fact that there's something in you that needs to be fixed. You have to face the fact that gone are the days where you can blame somebody else for your choices for your decisions and for your actions this ain't popular preaching but I gotta go ahead and tell it like the Lord give it to me somebody ought to lift your hands and say I gotta face me if I'm going to live in purpose and in destiny I have to face the fact that it ain't always somebody else sabotaging me sometimes it's me sabotaging myself every once in a while I gotta look in the mirror and stop looking through the lens and see myself as the problem for if I can fix myself I can fix my choices and if I can fix my choices I can fix my life who am I preaching to it y'all too shame to shout if it is you so shout because you've been delivered shout now because you're working on you and at the end of the day however your life turns out and no one else has anything to do with it it's on you and it's on God somebody lift your hands open your mouth and shout I gotta face myself I don't even want to know how you got the sixth one <laughs> I don't even want to know what the other five did to make the marriage not work I need to bring you face to face with you God, I feel like talking in here. I need you to deal with you so that we can fix that anxiety and that avoidance so that when you come into communion with yourself, you'll be able to walk with your head held high, your shoulders back, your chest out, and understand that every step you're taking is on the path of purpose and the road of destiny. Somebody lift your hand, shout, I'm going to face myself. So number one, I'm almost done. So number one, you're going to get over this anxiety and avoidance due to fear that keeps you out of the game of life. Face yourself. I'll preach better next week. But number two, if you're going to get over anxiety and avoidance, check this out. Not only do you need to face yourself, I love this next part. Um, Julia McNair 
We just need to learn to get over ourselves. And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's right here in the text. Danny, Thomas, Brian, heavy, it's, it's right here. Text. Text says that when Jesus makes her face herself, and he gives her <laughs> this revelation of worship and all that he shares with her, and when he says to her, you talking about a Messiah that you waiting on, but in coming face to face with yourself, you've come face to face with your God. <laughs> the text declares that just then, right after she gets the revelation, that she has to get over herself or come face to face with herself, the disciples showed up. I'm almost done. And when the disciples showed up, I'll preach this next week maybe, they were surprised that Jesus was talking to her, but nobody asked because the disciples had enough sense to mind their own business. The text says <laughs> that when the disciples showed up, y'all got to catch this, the woman dropped her pot. And the text says she ran back into the city. Hmm. Y'all going to catch this in a minute. Remember I told you earlier that she was trying to avoid the women in the city. And she went to the well at noonday to draw water to take back to her home. Interesting and conspicuous in the text is the fact that after Jesus makes her face herself, she drops the pot and leaves the well. Okay, that might not make sense to you. The reason she went to the well, I'm just teaching today, in the hot midday sun by herself, was that she might draw water at a time that nobody else was drawing and go back and take it to her home. After she had the encounter with Jesus that forced her to face herself, she dropped the pot. Okay, 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 okay. Where's my church, Thomas? <laughs> she went to get water. After she encountered Jesus and her encounter with Jesus made her encounter herself what she went to the well to get what she avoided the people in order to get so that she would not have to deal with him she forgot all about that and ran back to the city y'all miss what I said she ran back to the city without water which means now, watch this, she may not have had the water, but she had a revelation. And the revelation said that once I face myself, I can get over, I can get over myself. Because she did not run back to the village and go home. She ran to the village and she said to the men, come see a man that told me about myself. I came to preach to somebody here today to tell you that God is asking you. God is encouraging you. God is imploring you to get over yourself. Everything that the enemy has been using to convince you that you are of no use. Everything that the enemy has been using to convince you that you're too much of a mess for God to use you. Get over yourself. I need you to point across the room. This is real simple. I'll preach heavy uh, next week. But point across the room and tell somebody, get over yourself. Whatever it is that the enemy has been using to convince you that God can use you, get over yourself. Because the truth of the matter is, no matter how big your mess is, your mess is nothing more than material for your message. Am I talking to anybody in here who's learned to get over yourself? Who's learned how to deal with, with the enemy when he brings up about who and how 
you used to be. Is there anybody in here who's gotten over yourself? I know a few of y'all can take this mic. Some of y'all can say, they bring up my past, my drug use, and my alcohol use, but I've gotten over myself. They brought up my past about the fact that I had a child out of wedlock. I done got over myself. They bring up my past about what I messed up in my past. I done got over myself. I'm going to preach whether you want me to or not. For my addiction gave me my ministry. And the baby born out of wedlock is the best thing that ever happened in my life. And the mess that I made taught me lessons to prepare me for my future. Am I talking to anybody in here who done got over yourself? I wish you wave at your neighbor say, neighbor, I done got over myself. I wish you would too. I done got over my flaws and my faults and my mistakes. I done got over my mess ups and my mishaps and the like because I found out that with all of that, God can steal you. Come here, Paul. What is your story? I killed Christians. I persecuted and prosecuted them. But when I encountered him, I got over myself and became the writer of over half of the New Testament. Come here, David. Help me to preach it. I numbered Israel when I shouldn't have. I did what I did with Bathsheba, and I know it was wrong. What's your story? I'm still a man after God's own heart. And to this day, I got an ass sitting on the throne. Somebody lift your hands and shout, I done got over myself. gonna be your last day it's gonna be your last day living in avoidance and anxiety face yourself get over yourself <laughs> but thirdly reach beyond yourself <laughs> Mr. Tao Okay, catch, catch this real fast. Helen Jones, catch this real fast. Mike Pam Hamilton, catch this real fast. Uh, St. Dennis, uh, St. Keisha, catch this real fast. Text says <laughs> that after she had the encounter with Jesus, she drops her water pot, runs back into the city. King James says, New King James says, she said to the men, NIV says she said to the people, come see a man that told me all that I've ever done. NIV says, come see a man who told me everything I did. And she poses a theological question. Could this be the Messiah? I didn't go as deep as I wanted to, Mr. Diane Barnes, because I, I wasn't able, Miss Willie, to compare and contrast uh, Judaism and, 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 and Samaritan worship or religion. But consider that the one thing that they had in common was a coming Messiah who was the seed of Abraham. They had denominational and dogmatic differences but they both were expecting a savior to come. I know this seems like it don't belong in the message, but I wish you'd just wave at somebody and say, he is coming back. <laughs> he is coming back, and, and he's coming back for pure worshipers. He's coming back for real God seekers. No matter how flawed and how messed up and how jacked up they are, 
He's coming back for those who prioritize his presence in their lives. Uh, and the text says, somebody shout the text says, text says she goes back into the city without the water pot, without any water, and says to the men, come see a man that told me everything about myself. If I had time, I would mess with this a little further, Elder Barnes, and I would tell us, son, that this woman is a Samaritan and that the Samaritans are, are looked down upon by the Jews because they are a mongrel race. I would have you to know that they are the products of race and intermixing and intermingling of rape and the like. And I would have you to understand that they all had this dysfunction in their DNA. So even though they were criticizing this woman, <laughs> God have mercy, they had their own stuff that they needed to deal with too. But I'll talk about that later. Text says, somebody shout the text says, she says to the men, come see a man. In Bible days, my brothers and my sisters, and I'm closing, I really am closing. Uh, follow me, son, when I get ready, I'll let you know. Uh, in Bible days, Women had no authority, no political or social power. It was the men in the city, y'all gonna catch us in a minute, uh, that were the movers and the shakers. It was the men in the city who were the decision makers. Notice what the woman does. After dropping her pot, she runs to the city. And she does not say to the women that she's been trying to avoid, come see a man. She says to the men who have the authority in the city. Now, that's just the way it was in that day. It would be sexist today, but in that day, that's the way it was. I just came to preach the Bible. I ain't trying to preach theory. I'm just telling it like it T.I.T. is. Notice she goes to the men. What's your point, Bishop? I'm glad you asked. Uh, when, my brothers and my sisters, you face yourself and get over yourself, you learn how to pay no attention to those who have no power to determine your future. God, I feel like preaching. When you face yourself and get over yourself, you realize you owe no one any kind of respect or explanation as to what they think about you because what they think has no power to determine determine what your fate and what your destiny are. Y'all miss what I said. I got to get out of here because some of y'all ain't liking me. Notice what the Bible says. She, she says to the men, she says to the men, the movers, the shakers, the power wielders. Can I say to you prophetically, and I got to get out of here, son. I'm about ready to go two seconds. Like, Man, I say to you that once you face yourself and once you get over yourself, God is getting ready to usher you into a new realm of power, authority, and influence that will require you not to sweat the small stuff and not to pay attention to anything that would try to get you off track. I feel like preaching now. I'm ready to go, son. Find my key and let's go on and have church. Notice what the woman did. She went and she said, come see a man who told me everything about myself. And we know that the woman's word has power because the Bible declares that when she said to the men, come see him, they came out of the town and, and they made their way to Jesus. Can I fast forward to the end of the story? For at the end of the story, the Bible says that when they heard Jesus speak, they asked Jesus to stay for two more days. They said to the woman, now, we don't believe because of what you said, but we believe because of what we've heard ourselves. And I came to preach to some of you to let you know that once you get over your anxiety and stop avoiding what seems to distress you, you're going to have a whole new level 
and whole new degree of power. Somebody lift your hands and shout power. I'm going to close the lesson by telling you this. The women in the city who had problems with her, the women who were gossiping, the people who were criticizing, they had a lot of mouth, but they had no power. Y'all miss what I say. They had opinions, but they had no power. They even had platforms, but they did not have power. And God told me to tell you that you're getting ready to enter into your Isaiah 54 season. Isaiah 54 and 17 says to you that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Hey, y'all. God told me to tell somebody if you get over yourself after facing yourself, you'll be able to reach beyond yourself and do something that the devil said you won't be able to do. Can I go? If there's anybody here who says I've faced myself, I've gotten over myself, and now I'm getting ready to walk in the boldness of my power and my anointed. Come in, Joseph. What's your story? Joseph said, I had to face, face myself. I had to get over the mistakes I made. And now I'm reaching beyond myself to bless not just my city, not just my house, not just my community, but to bless the world. And God told me to tell you, get ready to bless the world with what he's doing in your life. Wave at your neighbor and say, neighbor, fear not. Don't be anxious. Don't avoid your call. Come out of hiding. You've been hiding. You've been sitting long enough. You've been embarrassed long enough. You've been holding back on your gift long enough. Can I go higher? Wave at somebody and tell a neighbor it is now your set time to have favor. Yes, it is. Yeah. He allowed men to ride over your head for a season. He placed you in prison. He let you go through hardship and darkness and distress. But now, now, you're getting ready to move into your wealthy place. Is there anybody under the sound of my voice who's ready to walk in your purpose? Is there anybody who's ready to walk in your destiny? Shout yeah! Shout yeah! Shout yes! Shout yeah! Come on here! Go to giving God about 30 seconds of real praise because you're ready to get over what was. You're ready to reach beyond what is. You're ready to move now in a new anointing. You're ready to move in greater power. You're ready for your gift to be increased. You're ready to walk through open doors. You're ready to go to new heights and new depths. You're ready to be all that God has called you to be. Shout yes. Shout yes. Say what you want to do what you please, but my heart is fixed, my mind made up, 
I'm walking in favor. I'm walking in purpose. I'm walking in victory. I am an overcomer. Shout yeah. Shout yeah. Shout yeah. Shout yeah. Yes, get over yourself, get over yourself, that was then, this is now, get over yourself, yesterday is gone, tomorrow ain't promise, stand in your boldness, stand in your promise, while it is today, shout yeah. I'm ready. No more fear. No more anxiety. You've been playing small too long. You've been undervaluing and underselling yourself for too long. There's an anointing on your life that can transform even the lives of your enemy. Just wave at somebody and say, you're bigger than that. You're bigger than that. You're better than that. Get up out the pig pen. Come up out of the muck and mire. Get out of that depression cell. Come out of that low place. You're better. your head up. I said, hold your head up. I said, hold your head up. I said, hold your head up. The reason I know that the enemy can't stop you because God walked you this morning, started you on your way. You're still here. You're still alive. You still have purpose. You still have favor. You still have God. What's yours? Go get what's yours. 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 Reclaim your, reclaim your authority. Reclaim your peace. Reclaim your dignity. Go get it. Please don't let me dance by myself for the next 60 seconds. Somebody ought to pick them up and put them down. You just got your word of deliverance. You just got your word of release. You just got your word of restoration. You just got your word of your next level. Somebody, somebody, help me pray. Get over 
rebellious. If God gave you another day, you ought to be thanking him now. You ought to be giving him glory. You ought to be magnifying. You ought to be lifting him up. Anxiety and fear and avoidance goodbye. Tell it goodbye. Tell it good riddance. Tell it it has no home with you. It's no longer welcome. Tell it to get out of your mind. Get out of your spirit. Get out of your heart. Come on, come on. Come on. Cast the demon and the devil of avoidance and anxiety out of your mind. I commanded to lose his hold on your household, on your family, on your bloodline, on your church pastor. I commanded to lose his hold and let you go. Yeah. Loose their gifts. Loose their gifts. Loose their anointing. Loose it. Take your hand off of it. Take your hand off of it. Let's go. It's time to go. <laughs> if the enemy could have stopped you by now, he would have stopped you. If he could have killed you by now, he would have killed you. If he could have made you go crazy by now, you would have already gone crazy. But look at you. You're still standing. You're still here. Still thriving. You're still growing. You're still elevated. Look at you. After all you've been through, you still got joy. Everybody lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, if there be any residue of fear, anxiety, or avoidance, we command it to go now. In the name of Jesus, we declare and decree that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. I command change to break. I command shackles to fall off. I command fetters to be broken. I declare, I command yokes of bondage to be destroyed. And I declare an increase of anointing. 
anointing upon your life. Those of you who are watching my time, those of you in this building, yes, yes, this is for you. This is for you. No more anxiety. No more fear. The Lord is your helper. What can people do to you? The Lord is your helper. What can people do to you? Are you? God will give you another job. Leave you. He'll bring more people to him. Two more seconds. The Lord just gave me a word of prophecy. Your building, your, your business failed. He said, I'm getting ready to resurrect it. He said, I'm getting ready to clean you up. I'm getting ready to make your name good with creditors. And I'm going to bring people into your life that matter. Who have power and authority and influence. To help you move to the next level of purpose and destiny. We got to go. If there's someone watching who does not know Jesus Christ as his or her personal Lord and Savior, whether you're watching or in this building, you can know him in the free pardon of your sin. Repeat this prayer after me, Lord Jesus. I thank you for this opportunity to give my life to you. I open my heart to you and I ask you to come into my life. I give you permission to be my Lord. I acknowledge you as my Savior. I make one confession for every sin that I've ever committed and every wrong that I've ever done. You said in your word, if I confess my sins, you would forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Father, I accept your forgiveness. I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for making me clean. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, with your presence, with your power, with your mind, that my life...